Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Innovate Fort Collins Challenge. My name is Jeff Mihalik, and I'm the Deputy City Manager. I'm so excited that we're all here together. I look around the room, and I see smiling faces. I see a few cocktails. I even see a few costumes, which I can't wait to see what's going on with that. But you know what I don't quite hear yet? I don't hear enough noise, because there's a lot of people here that are going to be presenting in just a minute that may be a little nervous, maybe a little shy, but you know what make them feel really, really good? If we just holler and scream really, really loud right now. One, two, three. <laughs> Feeling better? All right, I'm gonna try one more thing, but if you have stuff in your laps, it's too bad. We're gonna do the wave, so put your stuff down. Put your stuff down. We're starting over there, starting over there. I'm serious, this has to be fun, you guys. Ready, go. Scream, scream, scream. Uh -huh. Now how do you guys feel? No more butterflies, that's great. All right. Oh. <laughs> so you guys, fostering innovation really means collaborating, doesn't it? We have to collaborate together. Innovation comes when we cre have created cities and people fall in love with and residents and businesses really setting the tone and having a good time. So what we need to do tonight is to talk about the Fort Collins Challenge, which is funded by City Council this year to leverage city dollars that spark innovative solutions toward meeting our climate action goals. We want and need the community to get involved and excited about these goals if we're going to reach them. So City Council adopted this. You should be happy with that. They've funded it. And there are a couple council members here, at least I think the mayor's here. So you guys, please welcome Mayor Wade Troxell. Where's Wade? There he is. So thank you, Wade, for your leadership and for funding this program. I'm really excited. Any other council members here that I can't see? OK, great. We also have a number of members here from the City of Fort Collins boards and commissions. Board and commission members, would you please wave to everybody? Wow, there they are. Those are the subject matter experts in our community that provide advice, guidance, and recommendations to City Council. So very important people, incredible part of our fabric. And I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce one other critically important person who happens to be nine months pregnant she happens to be due today. <laughs> Our Chief Sustainability Officer, Jackie kozak -Till. Where's Jackie? Here we go. <laughs> Where'd it go, Jackie? Today? But not, but not now. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you, Jackie. So you guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn over right now to uh, Lindsay X, our climate program manager. Let's hear it really loud for Lindsay X. Thanks, Jeff, and, and thanks everybody for humoring him. I know how much he really appreciates that. <laughs> You all participated in everything he asked you to do. That was amazing. Um, thank you all so much to, um, for being here tonight. We, um, I am so amazed by this community. I'll, every time I get to work with you all, we had 19 proposals um, for the Innovate Fort Collins Challenge this year, um, worth almost $800,000 in requests. Um, and we want to really take a moment and thank everybody um, who took the time to submit that initial letter of intent and a proposal. We know how much work that you all put in. So a quick round of applause for everybody who's participated. <laughs> And our finalists, our six finalists who are here tonight, have put in a lot of work to get here to you. I've had a chance to visit with them, and I've been hearing about all the practice runs and the practice pitches that they've been putting together for this, and I know that they are all so excited to share their work. Um, and we really want to emphasize that these finalists were chosen because they're really um, a perfect combination of greenhouse gas emissions reductions, they're innovative, and we know at Fort Collins how committed we are to sustainability as a triple bottom line endeavor. So folks are really looking at the economic benefits, the social benefits, benefits and the environmental benefits as well. And we're so excited to hear from them about that tonight. If you know me, you know I love rules. 
I'm just kidding. Um, but for some reason, I've been stuck with the rules tonight, so I'm going to read them to you um, so that we can all make sure that um, we know what's going to happen tonight. So the presentations tonight are going to count toward 15% of the overall score for these finalists. We're going to compile the scores from our wonderful judges, who we're going to introduce in just a moment, um, and add them into our scoring process, and we'll announce our winners in mid-September. I have three very important things that I need you to be aware of. To honor our participants, we are going to limit exits and entrance um, during the presentations. Importantly, no flash photography. We are videotaping this. Side comments, like it might happen tonight, um, will be on videotape for all of posterity. Uh, <laughs> and then silence, not of your cheering and your clapping, but of your cell phones. So, um, and if anybody was here last year, you know that we're going to give away door prizes as well. So, um, you have to be present to win, but we've got some very, very exciting prizes for you. So, I want to introduce one new thing for this year. We have two city staff over here, I'm going to ask you both to wave, that are doing a graphic recording of the pitches tonight, and we'll be able to keep that for our work too. Has anybody ever seen a graphic recording? This is so cool. So um, if you, as you're enjoying your cocktail, take a look over at what our artists are doing. Um, and we'll be posting that on the Innovate for Collins website. So now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Fincham, who's our Municipal Sustainability Coordinator, to introduce our judges, who again are all members of our boards and commissions. Thanks, Lindsay. So I have the pleasure of introducing our judges who will be reviewing all of the presentations tonight and looking at the criteria. I'd like to start with Don Pepke, who is a member of our Community Advisory Committee for the Climate Action Plan. Next is Matt Tribby, who is part of our Air Quality Advisory Commission. And next is Jean Runyon, and she is a member of our Human Relations Commission as well as our Climate Advisory uh, Committee or Community Advisory Committee. Next is Elizabeth Hewditz, and she is part of our Natural Resource Advisory Board. Next is York, and York is part of our Transportation Board. Next is Emily Wynn, and she is part of our Youth Advisory Board. And finally is Denny Otsuga, which is part of our Economic Advisory Commission. So thank you very much to our judges tonight. Hey, our last speaker before we get to some of our presenters is somebody who you all know and is very passionate about innovation, our city manager, Darren Atterbury. Thanks, Lindsay. Is it, can you hear me? Well, um, my job is just to say um, welcome tonight. Um, you know, what I think about when I walked in here and every time I walk in this theater too, it just makes me so proud of this community and so what a privilege it is to be here. And, and um, you know, Jeff mentioned um, love. He doesn't usually do that. I was surprised that you mentioned that. And, um, but it really is an important part of our ingredient here in Fort Collins. And so what I, I just want to acknowledge that and just um, I'm so thankful for you all being here. I can speak on behalf of the mayor tonight and the city council and just say that we've got to continue to be mindful of how we're caring for each other, how we evaluate each other, how are we working together. Um, we know that if we want to foster a culture of innovation, it does take people who deeply, deeply care about this place. And, and um, so when I walk in and I see Jeff and Lindsay leading this, uh, this event the way they are, um, it comes out. They love this place. They deeply care for this place. And, and I just want to say really important in building a world-class community. So thanks, everyone, for that. Um, it also requires collaboration. And um, we know that we have that um, and more in Fort Collins. We also know that um, we're dealing with a lot of issues. And tonight, we're going to be dealing with some really important issues. But, but um, Martin Carcasson, who's at the university and is a communication professor, talks a lot about, and you've heard a lot about this, about uh, wicked problems. And I heard him speak in a course that I was part of last or a couple weeks ago. And what I love is he's very intentional about saying they're wicked problems, they're not wicked people. If we can continue to focus on the wicked problems and not wicked people, 
I think that we're going to be a lot better off. And I think for Fort Collins to continue to build on that is going to require us to be very attentive to that, that it's that we may have differences of opinion. We may have differences about how things should be done. But but let's let's have a very civil debate. Let's have very civil dialogue in this community and let's let's have it based on love of the community. Uh, the mayor talks a lot about ten dollar problems and the city is sort of our portion of that is almost a dollar. So the so so if you have a ten dollar problem and the city's going to play at sort of a dollar or two dollar level, well that requires us to co-create to come up with the additional eight um, eight or nine dollars. And so I think tonight's event is is really just exemplifies that 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 we are trying to help build an environment a culture of innovation, but. Um, but it takes a lot of people to co-create this community. We're not going to do it alone. The days of the city saying, you give us your problems and thank you very much, we'll pat you on the head and, and solve your problems. That's not how local government, um, that's not um, how it, it happens in 2018. And frankly, it's more fun. We get to be more involved, those sorts of things when, when we think about co-creation. So I, I love that about tonight. Um, you know, I think also, um, the fact that the city is very interested in collaboration and innovation. Um, we're also very interested in sustainability, and I think Lindsay and Jeff both mentioned this triple bottom line, that the fact that we're very, very attentive to the financial and economic health of the city, um, the environmental health, this, this community has had four, five, six decades of stewardship around the environmental uh, health of this community, and, and, and then also the social health it's really critical that we look out for things like social equity and, and, and just overall health. So um, stewardship tonight also talk, um, uh, talks about the increasing, increasing our energy efficiency for cost savings. It's the diversity of our energy portfolio and resilience. We want to improve our air and water quality for kids and families. We want to reduce waste. We want to expand multimodal transportation options for our workforce and community. And I think we're going to hear some of that, some of that this evening. And then um, I do have to acknowledge, and I heard Lindsay talk about the rules. I will not leave while someone's talking. I have to do that between speakers and presenters. I will do that, but I, I do have to leave early this evening. So please don't take it as a lack of interest on my part or the city's part for sure. And then um, let me just end with um, uh, thanks to those of you who have stepped up, you've submitted proposals. Uh, we look forward to hearing you present and, um, and um, give, give the judges your best shot and make Fort Collins really, really proud. And we're, um, thank you for your participation and thanks guys for letting me come up here and talk a little bit. for the inspirational words, Darren. We really appreciate it. You know, somebody else walked in that I want to absolutely recognize, and that's the executive director of our utilities, Kevin Gertig. Before we clap for Kevin, Kevin's been with the city for over 30 years. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I think we have the best water system in the country, especially by the taste and the color and the smell, right, Kev? We have the best sanitary system. We do so much innovative work with stormwater. And at some point, three or four years down the road, we're gonna have the best, fastest, and most amazing broadband system. And Kevin's gonna be the guy that's gonna manage us. Let's hear it for Kevin. <laughs> Seriously, you guys, 30 years of innovation by that man. If you ever get a chance to have a cup of coffee with Kev, please do that. So how many of you were here last year? Yeah, yeah wow, Ooh, come on, okay. So before we get started today, I think it will be important for the folks that are presenting tonight to get some inspiration from the winners last year. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay, let's do it. One of our winners last year was probably really pulled at our heartstrings and made a really huge dent, not only in people's lives, but also in the way we recycle materials and reuse them, and that is Springback, Colorado. So let's hear from them, one of our winners last year. Hello and good evening. Uh, I am Christopher Conway. I'm the president of Springback, Colorado. We are a nonprofit social enterprise mattress recycling facility. I'd like to start by thanking the city of Fort Collins um, for their generous and insightful gift to Springback, Colorado. And I'd like to share some of the results of that gift. Um, and I'd also like to thank Katie, our grant administrator, who did a lovely job keeping us on track and on point throughout the duration of our grant. 
And uh, the phase one and two of our grant allowed us to hire personal counselors for some of our men. If you don't know the story, um, all of our men are men in transition. They've all been incarcerated. Um, they've all been in drug and alcohol recovery centers. So we believe in crisis counseling along the way. We think the further you get away from some of your offenses, the more important uh, counseling and, and direction is for them. We were able to employ, uh, to provide three employees with GED assistance in their testing preparation. All three gained a GED through this grant, which we love. Thank you. Thank you. One of the, uh, the requests were to hire two additional full-time employees. Um, those men are still with us today, actively gaining, and one of them is in line to be one of our uh, uh, floor managers. So we're thankful for that. Roberto, our operations manager, was able to gain salary support through this grant funding opportunity to where he now lives in an apartment on his own for the first time. So that brings us a lot of pride. One of the innovations that we brought to our operation was a box spring separator. Um, we used to do this very archaically in that we'd, we'd mount a piece of metal onto the ground, take an apparatus, put it under our forklift, and try and separate wood from steel. The finishing touch was an aluminum baseball bat to denude any of the, <laughs> any of the staples that held that in place. Through some great innovation, we were able to purchase this box spring separator, which allows us to separate metal from wood in about 17 seconds. So great innovation for our operation. And I think our efficiency and production have gone up by about 75%. Phases three and four of our grant uh, opportunity have been to uh, provide housing assistance. Um, Roberto, as I mentioned, and some of the other, you may not know this, but if you go out and try and rent an apartment, there's an application fee. It's often 50 to $75. My men don't often meet meet the standards. Um, so it's, it's almost as though it's a, a way for them to generate income without really ever renting an apartment. So we've been able to get some guys into some very intentional housing opportunities. And we've also been able to offer them a living wage scale. And for us, that's $15 an hour pre-tax. And yeah, thank you. One of the biggest purchases that we were able to make, um, there's some of the guys, of course, was a 53-foot uh, semi-trailer that allows us to partner with uh, people in the surrounding area and, and do mattress recycling vicariously And that they do all the collection. It's a revenue stream for them. We ultimately end up with the mattresses that we're very intentional about. And that has allowed us to broaden our, our, our scope throughout the state of Colorado. So we're really happy to have that. We now have uh, nine trailers that are parked at various locations throughout the state of Colorado. And throughout the last year of operation, due largely to the Innovate Fort Collins grant funding opportunity, we have reduced the CO2E emissions by over 346,000 pounds by recycling over 24,000 sets of mattresses and box springs. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for innovation and inspiration. Really appreciate it. Amazing. So if those were who we were here last year, the group from CSU had the most energetic, fascinating, and funny presentation. And they were also, they have, I think they brought some people in the background. They were really rowdy, too. So <laughs> let's be honest about it. So I think I'll introduce CSU. And you guys should get really, really loud and obnoxious, because that's what they like. That's what they want to hear. So CSU, here we go. Hi everybody, I'm Erica Benti from CSU, and I'm here to update you on our project from last year um, called the Online Transportation Education Module. All right, so to remind you about our project last year, um, the aim of our project was to um, improve air quality, reduce traffic congestion, and increase safety by educating incoming students to CSU about their transportation options in Fort Collins and make sure that they were using those options lawfully and safely. So in this past year, um, we've developed the CSU Moves program. And um, we, so thankfully, we got to shorten our long name to CSU Moves. That makes it a little bit easier. And also, um, we've been working with CSU Creative Services 
to develop a set of six animated videos. Um, and then along with those videos, in our online education uh, platform called Canvas at CSU, we have lots of additional local detailed um, information. But the six videos cover the, the six topics that are listed up there. Um, so we're currently working with the group of incoming students this year, with a group of incoming students this year um, to test the project um, so that we can get their feedback and make changes um, and make improvements with the idea of rolling it out on a larger scale next year. Um, and then we're also exploring partnerships with universities across the country to actually allow them to use the videos as well and educate their students on the same principles. So I figured, why don't we introduce you all to this idea by showing you one of the videos. So I'd like to show you um, our video that's called Be Seen, Be Heard. In the wild, animals adapt to their surroundings. By being seen and heard, they increase their chances of survival. While some animals are masters of camouflage, birds of paradise are the kings of being seen. Their colorful plumage makes them impossible to ignore. Even in the cover of night, some animals make themselves known. The firefly lights the dark skies, and without a doubt, they are present. Some animals use their sight to make themselves known. By watching carefully, The tarsal uses his vision to communicate with others. When animals cannot be visually noticed, they find ways to get their point across. Although it cannot be seen, the goat's call is unmistakable to those around it. Through unique adaptations, the animals ensure their survival. It's a jungle out there and only the fit will thrive. All right, thank you very much. How fun was that? <laughs> awesome. Um, so for all of you that are about to present, this could be you in the future. Um, so the next, um, how, who's excited to see some pitches? Anybody? All right. All right, folks. So I'm a mama of young girls. I can't see you all, but if I had you raise your hand, I think you all know a young girl or a woman in the audience. Everybody, right? We all know young women. Um, and um, this next proposal, which I'm really excited about, is tying young women in our community to action. So I'm going to introduce Heidi, um, and she's going to give her pitch. The global temperature is rising such that an extreme heat day we once experienced every 20 years now is projected to happen every two to three years. Here at home in Colorado, we also will experience more wildfires. Our source for this information is NASA. At the same time, we're failing to prepare our young people now to problem solve and innovate to avoid climate disaster. Good evening, everyone. I'm Heidi Olinger, founder of Pretty Brainy, a local qualified charitable nonprofit, and our contribution to addressing these dilemmas is mission innovation. Tonight, I give you three things. One, what mission innovation is and why we're doing it. Two, how it works. And three, outcomes we will achieve. Mission innovation is girls and young women using engineering design thinking to innovate new, human-centered ways to reduce CO2 emissions. With guidance from mentors and experts, Team Mission Innovation will prototype answers to the problem statements of the Innovate Fort Collins Challenge. So why girls? The energy sector is one of the least gender diverse sectors of the economy. There are more women in tech than there are in energy. Because of this, mission innovation cultivates diverse people and ideas otherwise not at the table. Our participants are ages 14 to 24, which includes this community's number one demographic living at or below the poverty line. 
Mission innovation unfolds in two stages. Stage one is a two-day innovation marathon. 60 young innovators made up of college and high school students from throughout the region come together this fall at CSU. They collaborate on small teams, each team addressing a problem statement of this challenge. Mentors guide each team because for girls in STEM, mentoring is critical to success. Who are the mentors? Grad students and young professionals, near peers from whom girls can gain inspiration. Experts in climate science, behavior change, and engineering will provide insight and instruction. Through Pretty Brainy, girls are forming LLCs, inventing devices to address health and wellness, and engineering safe energy efficient lighting for Habitat for Humanity. Based on these outcomes, we project that demonstrably feasible ideas for reducing CO2 will emerge from the marathon. One of these ideas already is in development and it is the heart of mission innovation stage two. Stage two is a seven week behavior change campaign modeled on the University of California Cool Campus Challenge. Young innovators will design and build an application that zeroes in on what people need for design, interaction, and sustainable behavior change. Our innovators will work with data and lessons learned from current apps. Each participant of the California Challenge reduced their carbon footprint by just over one metric ton. We are assuming that Fort Collins can do at least as well as the Californians. <laughs> Behavior change and carbon consciousness begin at a young age. This campaign leverages the social media savvy and influence of young women. We estimate engaging 2,000 participants and reducing CO2 emissions by 2,000 metric tons. One year ago, Pretty Brainy brought together high school and college students to choose a cause for which they could use STEM to give back to this community. The cause they chose was climate action. I am here because girls chose to serve Fort Collins and girls chose to take action for the climate. Team, those of you who are here, would you please stand? These are members. Our student leadership team, I'm gonna get choked up. I have the privilege of mentoring and managing them with additional management help from the Pretty Brainy Board of Directors. Your investment Fort Collins supports four things. The two-day innovation marathon, demonstrably feasible ideas for reducing CO2 that emerge from the marathon. Three, the behavior change campaign and four, diverse contributions from diverse minds. Our request for funding in our grant application is $7,500. As we scale the program, we ask your scale of investment of an additional $2,500. This will be an investment in furthering the top prototypes that are human-centered and demonstrate clear feasibility for reducing CO2. Thank you for considering our full request of $10,000. All right, we have a few minutes for questions from the judges. Howdy, my name is York, and my question is, uh, you talked about the, um, the marathon, and it sounds like you've done that before. How many years has that been going on, and how many participants have been involved? Pretty Brainy has been doing service learning now for five years, and we have uh, piloted this innovation marathon in 2016 and in 2017. Yes, yeah, so we've now been doing it. This is going into our third year of doing uh, an innovation marathon. Our first go round of doing it, we had approximately, let's see, uh, 69 students. And for the second go around, we had 83 students. We did it at Fossil Creek High School. 
Hi. Do you have formalized partnerships with Poudre School District or other school districts in the region? We do. We have it with, um, for this particular event, with Poudre School District, with Thompson Valley, and with Weld RE4, as well as with Colorado State University. Hi, Matt Treby with the Air Quality Advisory Board. Yes. Um, from the Innovation Marathon, um, I, I know the, the projects can be complex or uh, kind of a, a quick initiation, but is there a relative average time frame from when the idea is innovated to getting off the ground and starting to be implemented? That's a great question. So given the, the generous time frame of this complete challenge, those prototypes that emerge from that two-day, 24-hour marathon that are assessed by the community to be tops in terms of their feasibility for reducing CO2, we will champion those through um, December 2019, which is the ending benchmark for this particular challenge. So to, to answer your question, how long does it take to get it up off the ground? Um, <clears throat> We have benchmarks, we have a, a timeline set up within our grant application, so we will help young innovators move that process along on a quarterly basis, so that by the time we're at December 2019, we'll have things ready to go. That is the plan. So again, on a quarterly basis. Denny Otsuga, Economic Advisory Commission. Yes. <clears throat> Are you charging any of those girls to participate in this program? And, and if you're not, what is your plan for uh, programmatic sustainability from a financial point of view? Excellent. Thank you for asking that question. So there is a nominal registration fee. Um, it covers uh, two days of meals and a little bit extra. Um, the full cost per participant is approximately $250. We're asking a, re a registration fee of 75. That said, we have uh, received funding from the Women's Foundation of Colorado, the Energy Institute um, at CSU, and private donors to put up scholarship funding so that the barriers to participation and access are removed. Emily Wynn, Youth Advisory Board. So you had mentioned a social media campaign component. Could you speak a little bit more about the specifics of that and what that looks like in reaching the younger demographic? Yes, thank you. Um, that's a great question. So again, we're basing this on the success of the Cool Campus Challenge of the University of, of California. Um, that also came out of their Carbon Neutrality Initiative. Their success was based not on gamifying something um, or racking up a lot of points, but on verified pledges that people would make online and then encourage the community through their documented evidence, either through a text story, video, photography um, that they were also posting and showing the community that what they were doing um, in new ways to reduce their carbon footprint. And so that was one of the lessons learned out of that California challenge. Yes, give people ideas to, for them to understand what they're already doing to live carbon consciously, but then also give them a real um, solid bank of new behaviors to adopt and integrate into their, their lifestyle. And that's what we want to leverage as well. Let's hear from Mich Let's hear from Mission Innovation. Thank you. Thank you. And judges, keep up the amazing questions. Those were great. I could see a lot of heads nodding. So, you guys have to indulge me one more time with one more introduction. But trust me, you guys will appreciate this. So, before we had Innovate Fort Collins the program, and before we had our climate action plan and operationalized it we had to have the climate action framework. Somebody had to uh, have the idea, and somebody had to have the brain power behind it. Our city manager, Darren Atterbury, is very wise when he says, we plan and then we do. We just don't run into anything. The person who was the architect of this, and the person who really taught us a lot about climate action planning, and I'm talking about for 10, 15, and 20 years, is our environmental services director, one of the most humble people I know, so I want you guys to be really loud for Lucinda Smith. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Lucinda. She's going to be mad at me tomorrow, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, next up is Solar United Neighbors. So how many of you know that 50% of our climate action plan is energy efficiency, right? And how many of you know that we need to be making more and more progress into, into renewable energy? I think we all know that. And at the same time, there's not a lot of uptake of solar in residential applications in the city. Here's the group, and here's their pitch. That's gonna make solar sexy. Everybody, <laughs> Solar United Neighbors. Great introduction. Thank you for that opening. Good evening, and thank you very much. That's what we're gonna do all right. Uh, we are volunteers for Solar United Neighbors. I'm Jana Six. I'm the co-founder of Alliance for Sustainable Colorado in Denver, and I was very active with the Sierra Club up here in Fort Collins for 10 years, so it's good to see everybody again. With me tonight is Deirdre McNabb. Deirdre is the past president of the League of Women Voters of Florida, and she started the Solar United Neighbors program in Florida for the last two years, and we are so lucky to have her now as a resident of Colorado. So we're here to tell you about this amazing, innovative solar program. Oops, just scoot over a second there. <laughs> um, we are here today to recruit you. We think Fort Collins is the right place for this program. You have done a staggering job already of reducing per capita carbon emissions by 34% since 2005. We believe that this program will launch Fort Collins into the leadership position in this state for taking rooftop solar forward. Colorado has slipped in growth in residential solar permits by 3%. We think this program is going to turn this around and show Fort Collins as a leader in ushering in the movement we need and we need today in clean energy. So I'm excited to just share with you this story launching on Heidi's program because it started with a 12-year-old boy named Walter. Walter went to see the movie The Inconvenient Truth and he came home and he said to his mother, Mom, we need to put solar on our roof. And when mom got the price, she said, no, Walter, it's too expensive. It doesn't make economic sense. Well, Walter didn't give up and he kept nagging his mother and she finally said to get him off her case, go and get the rest of the neighborhood interested and maybe we can get the price down. Well, Walter and his friend Diego did just that. They got 100 people to the public meeting and 50 said yes. They got the price down. Other neighborhoods heard about it and asked mom to do the same thing. And now there is this uh, nonprofit based in Washington, now in nine states, Solar United Neighbors. Thank you. So that happened, started in 2007, and now they have, as she said, nine states. There are 156 successfully completed co-ops in those nine states. And Solar United Neighbors has honed its program. It's now scalable, it's measurable, and it is ready for action in Colorado. So... If you would, raise your hand if you've thought about going solar on your own roof. Raise your hand. And keep your hand up if you went solar. Okay, that's why we need a solar co-op to close the gap between the people who are interested, and pretty much everybody is interested if they have a roof that works. And what the solar co-op does is it bridges the gap and helps neighbors working with neighbors and local community groups to understand how solar works, about the new economics, and very importantly, because of that bonding the neighbors together, it is able to reduce the price by as much as 10 to 20 percent, which means the payback for Fort Collins citizens is much faster and much more vigorous. So it puts more money in Fort Collins citizens' pockets. It saves money uh, for, from their utility bills so they can invest it in their children's college education and, their, and the homes they buy and the businesses they start. And it helps add jobs. And we have heard that over and over in Florida where we've done 36 co-ops in two years. So it hits the triple header. 
It uh, provides social, measurable social returns. We have a number of public meetings where neighbors go, come with neighbors, invite friends. It um, helps as far as the economics. It saves lots and lots of money, which is very measurable in terms of utility bills and investments in solar installers. And finally, it cleans up the air. I myself learned that with my solar panels, I have planted approximately 700 trees and saved several hundred tons of carbon emissions. Multiply that times 10 megawatts, which is what we have installed in Florida in just two years. So does Fort Collins even need this program? Because it's doing very amazing things. Thank you, Lucinda and everyone else. And has a lot of incentives for solar. But the numbers tell the truth. Fewer than 3% of the residences have solar panels. There are 60,000 homes in, in Fort Collins. Half of them are owner occupied, and that is our target audience. Uh, we would love to see solar panels on every side of every street and think that we can accelerate the adoption of solar very quickly in Fort Collins through this model. And we can do it for about a third of the cost that solar installers can acquire new customers. So we want to tell you more about the economics of how this program works. We are seeking tonight $30,000 from the Innovate Fort Collins Challenge, which will pay for a solar co-op for Fort Collins. Uh, that co-op is one of six we plan to do in the state for $200,000. We are looking forward to getting grants in the September to be able to launch coming up this fall. So what, what does the co-op offer? It offers advice and expertise from a state director who really knows their stuff and can answer the many, many questions. It brings in community groups from the Audubon to faith-based groups to the Sierra Club, which has been our constant partners, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the NAACP. We've gotten so many different groups who understand the need for sustainability, especially in a state like Colorado that depends on its snow and its snowpack for water. And lastly, thank you. <laughs> so we this, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Jean Runyon on the Climate Action Plan. Question for you. You've mentioned that this was very successful in Florida and also, you know, in some of the work you're doing in Denver. Have you vetted this idea of the solar co-op locally with any neighborhoods, other groups as well? Well, uh, both both Jan and I have been crisscrossing the state, talking to many different communities, and so far we have gotten commitments of interest who are ready to put money forward and want to participate from the city of Denver, Steam, Steamboat Springs, Westminster. Westminster, and the Roaring Fork Valley through CORE. Hi, Matt Tribby with the Air Quality Advisory Board. Um, Based on the successes you've had in other states, do you have an idea of if this program were to reach its highest potential, what would be the contribution megawatt-wise to what Fort Collins consumes? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure that we're qualified to answer that. I will tell you that uh, we have launched roughly 36 co-ops across the state of Florida in two and a half years with a total um, uh, installation of roughly 10 megawatts. So that's pretty sizable. Uh, now how it will work in Fort Collins, we don't know yet, but we would expect what we generally see is for an average co-op, uh, roughly 250 households will sign up to get a quote. And then we see any way, we see about a 30 to 40% uh, moving forward, signing a contract, installing the panel. So that, I think, will answer your question, I hope. I am York with the Transportation Board. Uh, you're asking the $30,000. I understand the overall program, but what is that going to actually pay for? That will support a full-time statewide staff director for the one-sixth of her time that she would, or her, his, that would, he would be spending on this co-op. It also helps pay for six national staff for Solar United Neighbors that have the technology expertise in solar and the organizing expertise. Also they do tracking so every week they are update, updating the tracking mechanisms that uh, we're following on number of panels, number of carbon emissions. 
I just want to clarify that those six people are based at Solar United Neighbors in Washington, D.C., doing all the, the background work, checking roofs from a satellite, and the 30000 would come to be as part of the money that we are um, gathering in the state of Colorado to hire one full-time director who would then do really one of the first co-ops right here in Fort Collins. Hi, Don Pepke with the Community Advisory Committee, I think. Um, <laughs> um, once the 40% you know, put the solar panels on their home, what does the ongoing support for them look like? That is a great question. Uh, generally, we see very little problems with solar installation. They don't require maintenance, and uh, when someone does have a problem, it's usually in the installation phase. And the beautiful thing is, and, I, and I've been involved in it heavily as a volunteer for two and a half years, I, I can think of, like, on one hand, the number of times people have called up to the state director, and they have an ombuds person to help them with the installer. What? Can I speak? Oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> well, one of the amazing things that I enjoy about Solar United Neighbors is that they give community support long after the solar co-op is completed. So even though the panels are up, they keep the people engaged, and they actually are creating an army of energy advocates. And so once these people have their solar up, they talk about the program, they help pass policies that will improve the program, and they continue to be involved. That's what I enjoy. I want to add that uh, it's not just the participants, it's also the groups, the Sierra Club, the League of Women Voters, uh, all the different organizations that get involved. And those volunteers, as well as the people who install solar, they write letters to the editor, they speak to their neighbors and friends, they go to county and city commissions to push for speeding up permitting and reducing the costs of permitting. So they become, we, just to, to echo what Jana said, we, we are building an army of solar and clean energy advocates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. I'm, I'm sure it's no surprise that our solar women also both wore yellow tonight. Uh, <laughs> And I'm told they didn't plan ahead on that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so often um, we hear, maybe you all have heard, that there could be some health impacts from climate change. But how many of you know exactly what to do when it comes to reducing your own health impacts? Maybe there could be a doctor in this, in this theater that could help us with that. I'd like to introduce our next pitch. Ugh, it's 2018. Why are these forms still paper? Oh, oh. Sorry I'm late, doctor. I got stuck in traffic on Harmony. I hate just sitting there polluting. Mm. Seems like driving is really raising your blood pressure. But what brings you in today? Well, my energy is low, I'm gaining weight, I'm feeling really down, and just mm. overall unhealthy. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we should change your medications. Let's try this prescription. <laughs> now, it's 2020, and I'm so glad tablets have replaced my paperwork. Oh. Doctor, sorry I'm late. I got stuck in traffic on Harmony. Mm. I hate just sitting there polluting. Uh, it seems like driving is really raising your blood pressure. What brings you in today? Well, my energy is low, I'm gaining weight, mm. I'm feeling down and just overall unhealthy. Hmm. It sounds like increasing your physical activity would help. I don't have time or money to join a gym and I'm very busy. Have you considered active transportation? It's great exercise. You'd reduce congestion in Fort Collins. You'd reduce your own carbon footprint and the community's mm. carbon footprint. And you could save money on gas and parking. What's active transportation? I don't think I have time for that. You might be surprised. Let me show you this heart program. It was developed by a team right here at CSU. You may have seen in the news lately, increasing your physical activity and spending more time in nature are really good for your health and can reduce your risk for common diseases like depression and cardiovascular disease. In fact, the benefits of being active in nature have form the foundation for really popular programs where doctors like me can prescribe time in parks. How is heart different? Well, 
Both of these can address all of the health problems that you mentioned, but with heart, we're prescribing time outside throughout the community and not just in parks. How did they create this program? Well, the program was developed through a pilot project where we gathered baseline and follow-up data from CSU employees, most of whom drive to work. Yeah, and given that CSU is the largest employer in northern Colorado, if HART changes this group's behavior, it would substantially reduce ga greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, and significantly benefit health. So all of this is just based on CSU? Oh, no. We also conducted several focus group conversations with experts in several fields. Let me tell you about those. Some of these experts that we discussed with were people just like me, medical health professionals. Others were from city government, and there were environmental educators involved. In addition, what this team has done so far is create a really interesting prototype interactive mapping tool. Oh. Yeah, it helps you pick the best route for you to move through the city using active or hybrid transportation. Well, is it hard to enter a route? Oh, no. You just click and drag, and based on the route you pick, heart calculates various health scores. Hmm. So shown here, with these hearts, you can see your cardiovascular health score, as well as community health benefits. And you can see those, like air quality, temperature, congestion, and economic benefits, hmm. that come from offsetting greenhouse gas emissions, shown here with their tree equivalent metric. So how did they design the calculators? I mean, is this real science? <laughs> oh, yes. Let me tell you. The health calculators were validated with healthcare providers. Hmm. The greenhouse gas calculators were based on published data adapted to local conditions. And the benefits of spending time outside of the car interacting with nature were informed by experts in the local and national park service. Oh, so if I was out of my car, I'd really help the environment. And I bet I'd see a whole new side of town to meet new people. There are a lot of parts here. Who exactly put this all together? Well, Heart was developed by a team from the Colorado School of Public Health and the One Health Institute. And they have skills spanning public health, psychology, behavior change, transportation, and engineering. There was also an experienced project manager to organize them all. Was there any input outside of CSU? Yes, the team collaborated with folks from the National Park Service, some of whom designed the original park prescription program. Then, of course, there was phenomenal engagement from the Fort Collins community. Citizens, healthcare providers like me, the city government, environmental organizations. All that great work must have been really expensive. You'd be surprised. Although the program is priceless, the team asked for only $43,000 for all of the design and to support public engagement events. And they proposed that should an additional $20,000 become available, they would bring in a software developer to improve the final product. I also understand that several CSU faculty contributed their time in order to reduce costs. This is just a pilot project, right? Could there be more? Yes. <laughs> Although the team began with only park and bikeway assets, the prototype could be scaled up to include the entire city and even adapted for use in other cities. I think even within the city, HART could be linked to local events. That would encourage active transportation to the events and also promote social community engagement. That is a great idea. Many of my patients would love that. Oh, and HART could be also um, adapted into an app and even gamified so I could compare my scores with other people and see who else near me is doing active transportation. These are wonderful ideas. I'm so glad we discussed HART. Thanks, Doc. You've really helped me realize the importance of physical activity for my health and how active transportation can help me and promote health in my community. I realize this is just a pilot, but I'm looking forward to being part of it as I see the potential for it going to a larger scale. Everyone needs heart. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth Huda, it's uh, Natural Resources Advisory Board. Um, how are you gonna promote this? How are you gonna let people know about it? Sure, um, well our pilot project um, initially is a feasibility pilot, so we're working with a cohort of 100 CSU employees, um, and that's why we showed the data on exclusive drivers um, to work with them to, uh, on what would motivate them to do more active transport and also working with the prototype tool and how they would like that to, what user interface, et cetera. Um, and then 
uh, the idea is, uh, by gathering that data, we would know more about motivation and how we can roll that out um, more broadly to the community um, and including local businesses um, and getting beyond CSU. But because CSU employees primarily are Fort Collins residents, uh, it was a way to uh, begin and to get that information. Hi, Don Pepke with the Community Advisory Committee. I'll get that down eventually. Um, <laughs> there are already, as you probably know, several great programs yeah. in our fair city. Mm -hmm. Have you developed uh, collaborative partnerships with them or are working on that? Is that part of your um, strategy? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have met uh, with FC Bikes, actually, and had an initial conversation with them and their existing programs um, as a logical way to collaborate. Um, also, we met with GIS mapping staff uh, from the city to make sure that we understood the available open source mapping um, and how we could work with those existing assets. Um, we also um, plan to work more towards a partnership with UC Health to add the um, health component to this. Um, and they have clinical services on the CSU campus, so that's a way for us to connect with them. Um, so, and transportation services at CSU. Um, they're an active partner and are really excited to work with us um, on this. As they do an annual survey on transportation behavior, that's where that data came from um, every year, and want to include some of our health questions in the survey. Denny Otsuga from Economic Advisory Commission. <clears throat> so once you develop an app, like any software, uh, need to be kept up with changes in OS mm -hmm. and such a thing. So like, it requires cost to maintain. Yeah. What is your plan to continue maintaining this app and uh, uh, sustaining your activities? Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question and, and something we did talk about a lot. Um, I, CSU has a lot of in-house capacity, um, both to collect data and also GIS mapping and um, software capacity. So that's something we know we can sustain to, sustain to a certain level. But in terms of scaling the program, we definitely want to look at private investment um, so that we can keep that going um, and keeping that money flowing in order to keep the app sustainable. And we're also hoping that we can interest other other cities in the front range to do this as well. So get it down in Fort Collins and then try to advocate for this to catch on in other places um, where active transport makes a lot of sense with all of our bikeways and, and ways of getting around. You work, with the you work with the Transportation Board and so it sounds like a cool idea. How does it relate though to things like Strava and other applications that are already out there that do the mapping and with your weight and all of that keep track of what your health impacts are? Sure. Um, our innovation is really connecting um, all of the different factors that we talked about in terms of health indicators, but also um, by mapping the routes, you can say, well, if I drove, uh, what score do I get, right? As compared to if I chose to bike the same route, what would that do, both for my health and for saving money on gas and also um, my carbon footprint? And then how does that compare to other people I know or that are in the area? So it's trying to combine those factors together rather than like having your Fitbit and then trying to figure out, you know, how much you're actually driving and what you're spending on gas. Yeah, the, in addition, yeah. The, those other apps are primarily focused on the, the benefits to self and, and not as much right. about the benefits to the community. So the environmental piece is some added value beyond what you can find existing. Let's hear it for heart. So in case anybody was wondering, and just to be clear, we are aware of the traffic challenges on Harmony Road. <laughs> 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 right. so, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, so our next presenter is the NoCole Tool Lending Library. A really neat, innovative idea. How many people have a wheel, wheelbarrow? And let's be honest, how many people use it? Hardly ever, right? These guys are going to tell you why we need a tool library. Here they are. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. It truly is an honor to be here amongst uh, such an amazing group of finalists. Uh, my name is Stacy Keckritz. And I'm Caitlin Young. 
Recently, I found myself elbows deep in a plumbing project that required specialty tools. I saw my only options to rent or buy the tools, which gets really expensive, or try to hound down a neighbor or friend who had the tool that I could use. I wish there was a better option. So that's what we're here to talk to you tonight about, is that better option and the possibility of Fort Collins having its own tool lending library. Um, so, Denver has a lending library, Boulder has a lending library, and even Des Moines, Iowa has a lending library. So I think it's well past time that Fort Collins has its own lending library. And as the owner and manager of EcoThrift, a thrift store in Northwest Fort Collins, uh, I'm finally in the position to help make this happen. But I'm not the only one who wants this. This really has come out of a response to uh, um, needs expressed by both our customers and the community. We've pulled together a dedicated group of volunteers who are currently converting the middle garage in this picture into the home of the NOCO Tool Lending Library. That one, just figure out how to advance here. Okay, um, so what exactly is a tool lending library? It really basically is what it sounds like. It is a warehouse full of tools that members can borrow to complete their own projects at their own locations. Lending libraries tend to be very collaborative environments with a strong focus on educating and empowering their members to take an active role in the maintenance of their own homes, vehicles, neighborhoods, and they should be accessible to all. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, what exactly does a tool lending library have to do with greenhouse gas emissions? Um, first and most obvious is the reduction in consumption of tools, including the packaging and fuel associated with their sale and transport, uh, thus resulting in a reduction to pollution and a reduction in waste reaching the landfill. But there's so much more to this than just that. Our tool lending library will also have a focus on um, having newer, more energy efficient tools that, might other, that our members might otherwise hesitant, hesitate to purchase outright. As members become more knowledgeable and empowered to take on their own repair and maintenance projects, they will also be learning the difference between well-made equipment that can last for years and lower quality tools that are often disposable, nudging them towards better purchases in the future. We also see a, uh, a potential for increased waste diversion from our own store as more people are exposed to the quality, quantity, and diversity of secondhand products available in our community. By introducing our members and the community at large to the social, economic, and environmental benefits of participating in this sharing economy, we will be assisting them to, in making long-term changes to their consumption habits in general, not just with regards to tools. So, where are we at? We currently have the space, up to 1,200 square feet, we have an insurance company willing to work with us, and we have a large pool of donated tools. We have an online presence, albeit rudimentary at the moment, thanks to a fabulous software platform called MyTurn, which will allow us to manage both inventory and membership. Through our research and reaching out, we have tapped into this amazingly supportive and generous network of lending libraries who have enthusiastically guided us through the planning and execution of our own library. So what do we need to make this a reality? We are asking for $25,000. 15,000 of that will go towards covering the costs of hiring the first director of operations. 8,000 will go towards the purchase of green tools, such as battery-operated lawn equipment or yard care equipment. Uh, and the re remaining 2,000 we want to put towards scholarships and outreach to make sure that everybody in our community really knows about and is able to take uh, advantage of this incredible resource. We will also be hosting a crowdfunding campaign in conjunction with our initial membership drive to collect the additional funding necessary to maintain staffing and cover tool maintenance beyond the scope of the grant. So why is a paid staff position so crucial at this point? Basically, we've brought this as far as we can as a volunteer crew, and it's what our membership is telling us they really want. Um, we need, uh, to ensure safety, we need a dedicated person responsible for the oversight and maintenance of the tools, and also to ensure that members are properly trained in usage. 
We have created the foundation. Now we just need that dedicated person to take the reins and guide this project into the self-sustaining uh, and expanding enterprise we know it has the potential to become. We really see the NOCO Tool Lending Library as an organically scalable project. As membership increases, so does our capacity to expand tool inventory, hours of operation, and staffing. Many libraries across the country have added mobile units, greatly expanding their ability to support local schools, nonprofits, and community cleanups by having the tools and expertise available when and where they are most needed. We also see a high probability of opening up one or more additional locations down the road to better serve our entire community, helping to create more resilient neighborhoods and informed consumers. And with that, we can't wait to sign you up as a member for your tool lending library and to see you enrolled in the first workshop. Emily Wynn, Youth Advisory Board. Um, so you had mentioned allocating some money to specific outreach. So how do you plan to advertise the tool lending library throughout the community to uh -huh. really allow the city of Fort Collins to know that it's occurring? So uh, partially through our existing website uh, for my business and then social uh, media pages. Uh, we also plan to attend as many community events as we can that we feel like attract people who would be interested in this and promote it that way. Um, and word of mouth, we already do have a collection of a couple hundred people who are interested in being members, and so it's so far spread through our customers' word of mouth, social media, and events. Hi, Elizabeth Hewitt, Natural Resources Advisory Board. You say you're membership-based, and yet it's going to be accessible to all. How does that work? So uh, based on feedback we've gotten from both Denver and Boulder, uh, we're looking at charging about a $100 uh, annual membership fee. Um, but we will also have scholarships available, and then a portion of um, the membership fee can be covered by volunteering through at the Tool Lending Library or through the donation of tools. So scholarships, donation, volunteer are ways to cover the expense of membership. Hi, Matt Tribby with the Air Quality Advisory Board. Um, two very quick questions. The first is, um, if someone wanted to rent a tool, like you said, you're in a situation, you realize you don't have it, you're a member, do you go get the tool, or would their ability be for someone to deliver the tool? And this, the other quick question is, in Denver and Boulder, do you have any data on once the programs were established, what participation was? Um, I do not have data on specific participation. Um, I do know that the Denver Tool Lending Library has been around for about eight years now and has consistently grown uh, year upon year. As far as... Uh, access to tools, we would have all of the tools in-house. I don't think we want to be uh, facilitating borrowing tools from other people that we are not overseeing the maintenance on. Um, the lending library platform is incredible in that it lists all of the tools, you can categorize them, you can see availability, and you can even reserve those online ahead of time. So we avoid the issue of somebody coming down to the store thinking they're going to get a certain tool for a certain project and it not being there. Um, and then tool acquisition will also depend really on what our uh, members say they need. We've already done some initial surveying about what the highest demand tools would be. And in the future, we do foresee having a mobile unit where we can go to different events that are happening in town, kind of like um, a mobile bike repair unit or something where we can bring the tools to different places and not just have it at the EcoThrift. Denny Otsuga, uh, Economic Advisory Commission. Uh, very good job in providing sustainability and scalability and market access uh, on your presentation. Um, what level of revenue do you need to continue to sustain this uh, program going forward? Mm -hmm. um, so we've projected that if we can get uh, 200 members within the first year, that that would allow us to be sustainable into the following year, um, and we really don't foresee that being an issue. We think we can actually surpass that 200 number pretty rapidly. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. So I might need Jeff up here for this one because I have a question for you, Jeff. When you um, think about renewable energy, what happens to you? Because uh. when I think about solar, I get pretty hungry. You do? I do, yeah. I do. In fact, what I get really hungry for, 
Yeah. Tacos. Really? Yeah, I actually, I've, I've learned that those two are really related. Okay. In fact, it makes me want to talk about solar. Oh. oh. <laughs> Does that count towards my six minutes? Because that was a great sell. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thank you all so much for being here. It is an honor uh, to be in front of you and to get to be a finalist among such great folks. Uh, today, I get to talk to you about Talk About Solar. It's a renewable project on a mission to make it an expectation that people should get unbiased third-party information about solar. Is it right for them? Should they get it on their house? How should they pay for it? How much should they have? Now, we want to do that for two reasons. One reason is because right now, if somebody's curious if solar's right for them, let's start the slideshow. If somebody's curious if solar's right for them, their option is to Google it or invite somebody into their home to sit at their table to try to sell them something. That process is an awesome. And further, of all the people that get solar, about half of them never get a second bid, quote, or opinion. We deserve a better process, wouldn't you think? So, before we get into that, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about myself and Renewablu so you can understand better the how and the why we got here as a program. Now, let's only circle back as far as CSU days, right? So I did go to CSU. I graduated with a degree in real estate finance. Go Rams? Anybody? Yeah, go Rams. And then from there, I went into uh, real, residential real estate with the group. Been a partner there for 10 years. I've also been really involved with the National Association of Realtors, or NAR, as an educator for the green realtor designation. And I'm on the advisory council for that education, choosing what realtors need to know when it comes to green. Now, I don't say that to impress you. I say that to impress upon you that when I tell you this is my passion, this is my passion. And one of the greatest accomplishments I've had is the ability to work with Jesse Ferguson. She is our business operations officer, and she is the stage manager, which is why I'm up here right now, and she's not. Okay? We've been working together for four plus years in real estate with a focus on green. That's taken us into a lot of households. And what we find is that we solve a lot more problems than create value when we sell somebody's house that has solar. Whether we're working with the elderly person that has twice the size system they ever needed and spent twice as much as they should have for that system, what we wanted to do was get in front of it. By getting in front of it, we can talk about it and we can provide education. So why talk about it, right? Well, because we called them solar seminars, we tried that three times and nobody showed up. <laughs> solar seminars are boring. So we said, well, why don't we do this on Taco Tuesday, give some people some tacos, offer some awesome free education. Well, we did six of those, and we went from zero to averaging 10 per class. What we find is that education is key. That's what everybody wants. When we say our why, that is to say those are the problems we solve, and education is one of those. But not just education, advising so we can get people on a roadmap, so we can create clarity because clarity creates a decision and with better information, we get better decisions. Now, if we do this properly, we can speed up the adoption of solar. So what properly looks like with Taco About is it's a free class. They're free, they're 90 minutes long. We give people tacos. We go through the who's, the what's, the why's, the who's of solar. Is it right for you? Should you do some energy efficiency as well? Okay? That's what we do with Renewablu. That's, we are a conscious capitalist company providing home solar and efficiency consulting. That's our company. Taco About Solar is our outreach. That's why this is free is because we want to never have to solve a problem again. We want to create a solution moving forward. Solar is supposed to grow a lot. Now, the, we're somewhere around here. Now, 3% or so of the homes in Fort Collins have solar, but in the United States of America, it's less than 2% of all homes have solar panels on them. My estimation is that the education and clarity is what's gonna take us from there up into that nice hockey stick exponential growth. That's what we're here to do. So what we're asking for is 8,000 bucks. That number is created because we've been doing these. We know how much it costs to run an event, but we also know that we can grow to a scale. We need to get in front of a better audience. 
That's going to get us the advertising, the marketing, and the awareness campaigns here locally to create something that draws in a larger, a larger audience. It gets us 12 face-to-face -face classes. It gets us a video platform so people can watch it on their own time and not mine. And realtor education to me is key because at the end of the day, when that home sells, a realtor has to know how to help market, value, and sell those solar panels for value. This becomes a little class in a bucket. We can scale out. There's tacos all over the world. We can go anywhere and teach this class. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about the actions, but if I'm going to get some money from the city of Fort Collins, you probably want something in return, and I think that's fair. So we're going to do these actions. We're going to do some tracking, enter Jesse's brain, right? Jesse, when I met, it was like a left brain meeting a right brain and just like having a great time, and finally I could get some forward progress and do some stuff, and it's awesome. She's going to help with that. We're going to be able to track intake and outtake surveys. We're going to be able to track our social media platforms, which is where we're doing most of our promotion. We're also going to have six-month and 12-month follow-ups. Did you do anything? What did you do? Did you expect that's what you would do? But it's not just all sunshine and kilowatts. The biggest risk to this, to me, is that we have to maintain the integrity of the class. That's why there's no solar sponsor for this class. That's why the city of Fort Collins is a great partner in this. And at the end of the day, solar is expensive and, it's, and it's, com it's complicated. So even all the education in the world might not help. What we want to do is we want to leverage and energize the one solar industry here so we can activate what I call a win-win to the exponential degree. Thank you very much. These are our next two sessions. We hope you will come talk about solar with us. The Neo Tsuga Economic Advisory Commission. Uh, so I, I get the tacos are scalable, but uh, you're not scalable unless you develop the cloning technology. So can you talk about scalability of your program going forward? The information is what we're after. We're creating a roadmap, a checklist. That's scalable. What else is scalable is finding another person like me that's passionate about solar from an, from an objective third party to go teach these classes. But we're creating that class in a bucket. Now at the same time, the most scalable part of what we're doing is the video platform. Part of that $8,000 goes to put this class on a video platform. We have, we have a homeowner focus. We have a realtor focus. We also have a class focused on landlords, right, since we're a college town. So those, those videos become the scalable piece. And those videos are something that I feel would be really amazing to make every single person in Fort Collins before earning their solar rebate, which is 1500 bucks. If you're going to get that 1500 bucks, you should have to get this information, objective, third-party, non-biased, to make sure you get, the, you get it done right the first time, that you layer efficiency in with solar, that you right-size for today or tomorrow. Those are the scalable uh, aspects of this project. Hi, Don. Hi, how are you? Um, Don Pepke with uh, the Community I had Advisory heard earlier, yeah. Committee. <laughs> we have to say it every time. Um, how are you measuring the success of this program beyond the size of your classes? So on action, people in our classes that want to engage will then go through the City of Fort Collins Efficiency Works Utilities Program. You have to do that to get your $1,500 rebate, so it's a good hook. Right? So after the classes are over, we have the outtake survey, are you, you know, intake survey. Were you planning on doing solar already, yes or no? Outtake survey. Now are you still or not planning on doing solar, yes or no? But the real thing is six and 12 months later, part of our budget goes to send out a follow-up survey. What did you do? Did you, ex did you do what you expected? So on and so forth in a way that we can get that information back, but we also have to bribe them. So anybody that fills out that survey is going to be entered to win a $100 downtown gift card here in Fort Collins to, tr to make sure we get that information because that's the most critical component to the tracking piece here, what was actually done. So with the 8000 uh, I'm York with the Transportation Board. Um, so with the $8,000, you said that will work for one year. What are your plans going forward after that? Say thank you or ask for more money. We think we'll be able to create, well, I'm a business. You heard the words conscious capitalist, right? That means I care about what we're doing. We try to do good first. We don't do less bad, we do more good. This should be able to help us create a platform where the city, can, somebody else can take care of this. It can go online, it can live. What we want to do is then start helping people actually get it done. 
this class is built for the DIY person, but you can teach me how to do TurboTax all day long, but I'm still gonna hire a guy to do it for me because he's the expert. And it's literally a he. If it was a she, it would have been a she, I swear. So my guy is who I call. So that's what we want to get to. So we can really get more people to that actionable point by bringing them clarity. Okay, time's up. Thank you so much. Thank you. So most of you know that we have a climate action plan, but you, did you also know that we have an, inc an equity and inclusivity plan that's equally important in the city of Fort Collins? Our next group is She's in Power 3.0, which is the process of merging our equity and inclusivity plan and getting more women to work in the renewable energy field. Everybody, She's in Power 3.0. So I am Ellie Troxel, an engineer and project manager at Brendel Group, and I also serve on the steering committee of Colorado C3E. And I'm Judy Dorsey, also with Brendel Group and Colorado C3E. And we wanted to give a shout out to our other C3E members who are here this evening. Shout out, woo! <laughs> I, might, I should have had them do the wave. What do you think, Jeff? Anyway, um, we're also wearing our All In Power Pledge um, uh, stickers. C3E stands for Clean Energy Education and Empowerment. It's an international initiative to close the gender gap of women in clean energy. In the United States, it's operated by the Department of Energy. And in Colorado, it's operated right here in Fort Collins, with Colorado Clean Energy Cluster being our nonprofit home. And when it comes to the Innovate Fort Collins grant, it's important to know that C3E has a long history in innovation and that we have a good track record in growing momentum around creativity and actionable results. So with this grant, we would use the resources to enhance our offering to focus on greenhouse gas emissions reduction delivered through in, um, expanding our workforce development efforts. So not unlike Rosie the Riveter campaign in World War II, when we think about at Colorado C3E, the urgency and the magnitude of our community's greenhouse gas reduction goal, we um, feel like we have to engage the entire workforce to achieving our efforts. But what I am personally most excited about at Colorado C3E is we really, really walk the talk on the empowerment part. And so we provide leadership opportunities. And case in point, Ellie would be our Brendel Group project manager, and she has the full support and backing of our C3E steering committee and our Colorado Clean Energy Cluster Board of Directors. So what is She's in Power? Well, She's in Power is a mentorship program engaging women and girls from K to gray to nurture their interest in retention and clean energy. And our concept is to add a new element to She's in Power that is a workforce development platform and is scalable through the numbers and types of clean energy projects implemented. And in this new element, we're going to be engaging our mentees that we call sparks and mentors that we call energizers to implement hands-on clean energy projects in Fort Collins along with technical support. So therefore, oops, come on. Uh, these projects are the delivery mechanism for energy savings with measurable reductions towards the city's greenhouse gas goals. And we will be working with women and girls of different ages with diverse interests and skill sets, and then matching them with appropriate uh, clean energy projects. For example, an elementary to middle school age spark um, with assistance could go into a commercial building and conduct a lighting audit. A high schooler uh, could plan and host a home energy party for their neighbors and friends. Uh, uh, sorry, a college aged uh, to mid-career woman could determine uh, the solar potential for home or business to any, uh, any woman with a custom project in mind. And we have a number of sources and relationships that we would be pulling on um, to, to compile a comprehensive list of projects based on our ex um, varied experience and history um, with implementing grassroots uh, community energy projects. So uh, in this first year of implement implementation, we're working to implement uh, 20 uh, projects with our sparks and energizers with the shown energy reductions equivalent to 1,000 metric tons of carbon reduction or 108 homes total average annual energy use within Fort Collins. 
And let me introduce our team. So the grant would be administered through the Colorado Clean Energy Cluster and housed through Colorado C3E, um, led by sub-consultants Brendel, Brendel Group and Toolbox Creative, and then with support from all of our partners that make She's in Power a success, including Prinny Brainy that spoke earlier tonight, um, as well as the CSU Energy Institute. So how would our team accomplish our goals? We estimate the total project cost to be $110,000. We've created a project plan that has four tasks designed to mitigate risk and remove the barriers that we know to be associated with mobilizing volunteer groups. The first task would be around planning and communications and messaging. Our second task is on the actual development of the new um, element of She's in Power. This is a one-time investment that can be used over and over again in many years to come. Then we would actually deliver the implementation of these projects into the field in our third task, followed by our fourth task around measurement, verification, and refining and improving for future years and subsequent um, eras. So where would this money come from? We um, would have $60,000 in cash and in-kind contributions, so the net difference is a $50,000 request of the city's Innovate Grant Program. So we want to look at, for the $50,000 in, what are the outputs? $60,000 in matching funds. The energy savings would reduce, uh, would save $150,000 in utility bills in homes and businesses. And uh, then 30,000 additional dollars for the social um, cost of carbon associated with our greenhouse gas reductions. So that's a five to one tipping of the scale between the inputs and the outputs. But then when you consider the economic development potential of having an educated, experienced, diverse, clean energy workforce in Fort Collins, the value is even greater. And then when you consider if we even made the impact of one single girl and a positive influence in her life, then the impact is even greater. So we would like to say thank you for your support. We um, hope that you've been inspired by this. And we invite you to also join the All in Power campaign to put everybody to work at achieving Fort Collins greenhouse gas reduction goals. Thank you. Dean Renan, Human uh, uh, Relations Commission. Question, you mentioned that some of the funding would go for the development of curriculum and to support the projects. Would the curriculum be eventually available as open educational resources and free to use um, and adapt, or would it be copyrighted? Um, yes, it would be free and open to use and adapt and not copyrighted. Hi, Matt Trevi with the Air Quality Advisory Board. Um, the numbers you put for a gigawatt reduction and potential metric tons of CO2 uh, equivalent, do you have a time frame of when those would be uh, achieved? Yes, we have a 10-year time horizon, but an average um, uh, kilowatt hour reduction of a thousand metric ton, or a thousand, sorry, thousand kilowatt hours per project implemented. So 20 projects within the first year, but looking at direct savings and not counting for any indirect savings from projects. And, and so those savings are for those 20, pro 20 projects, cumulative savings over their project life. Emily Wynn, Youth Advisory Board. So what does the incentivization process look like for young girls and professionals alike, how to get them involved in the process and um, want to be a part of the program? This is a nice opportunity to also acknowledge our partners, Pretty Brainy and Toolbox, and that, that program design, when we talked about mitigating risks and barriers, that incentivization would be a deliberate part of our task to program design and delivery, building on some of our experiences from last year and from the expertise that they bring to our effort as well. Yeah, and just to add on to that, we really see this as a resume builder um, for those sparks that are looking to gain more experience in clean energy um, and hopefully fuel their interest to pursue a career therefore in that. All right, everyone. Can you believe we've already been through all six of our pitches? Um, what a fabulous, fabulous evening. Um, I want to take a moment and recognize and give a big hand for all of our judges. Um, I think we all, I just want to say one more thing about our board and commission members. You could really tell from the questions that they asked. This is second year in a row. Um, the Youth Advisory Commission, you guys are killing it. Um, thank you so much for your awesome questions. Um, and just thank you to everybody for all of your engagement. 
So from a process perspective, we're going to announce awards in mid-September. Um, and you can check back at fcgov.com slash innovate. Um, let's do a couple of thank yous. So we mentioned them earlier, but City Council has just been a huge supporter of this program. So a round of applause for Council. Y'all, Jim Brown has been a volunteer on the Climate Action Plan, and he is the one who has helped all of our finalists prep for tonight. Um, he is just an amazing, amazing volunteer, and he really helps to make tonight so amazing. So a round of applause for Jim, too. I want to also thank the Lincoln Center for hosting tonight. You guys have been so amazing, um, and all the city staff who um, have really helped with this project. I want to thank a woman that was recognized at the beginning of this, um, and I think it's only proper that we close out with this. Jeff calls her KMAC. Um, Katie McLaren, um, who has been our project manager on this, has led us through this. Thank you so much, Katie, for taking this to a very, very nebulous concept into the wonderful, wonderful two years of events, one of my favorite events of the year. So everyone, um, we are just so grateful for all that you do in this community. Um, one of our presenters mentioned that we're down 34% per capita, and that's not done by accident. We have a very, very committed community, um, and we're just so excited. And I just want to take one more moment um, and honor the amazing finalists that made it to pitch night tonight. So thank you all for coming, um, and enjoy your evening.